Morning, Fellowship family. I'm going to invite you to stand. Let's sing and celebrate the shelter that we have in Jesus Christ. When all, when all I see is the bad, you see my fig tree. When all I see is the mountain, you see the mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I'm safe. Sing it together if you know it, so it. So when I find, find on my knees with my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, and I sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, can be against me. For Jesus, there's nothing impossible. Good morning, fellowship. You, you may have a seat. Hey, my name is John. I'm one of the pastors here, and I know what you're thinking right now. Pastor got him a new sports coat. We don't dress up too much around here. We're kind of casual. I know I borrowed this from Mickey. No, I'm just kidding. This is mine. 
Uh, hey, we're glad you're here this morning. We have parent-child dedication, so I thought I'd dress up a little bit more, but we are glad you're here this morning. If you are new or you're visiting or you wanna get connected, we would love the opportunity to get you connected. You can scan the QR code, fill out some information. We'll follow up with you uh, right away, or you can stop by the booth in the middle of the foyer and we'll answer any questions you have. We are a church that gathers here every Sunday of the year and studies the scriptures together and worships the Lord together. And then we scatter and we meet in small groups all over Northwest Arkansas in living rooms, in coffee shops, and in conference rooms. And we'd love to, for you to be a part of that and get connected here at Fellowship. Well, like I mentioned, today is Parent-Child Dedication Day and we have Robin Yates here with me. And Robin is our early childhood director. So Fellowship, we have early childhood, which is like five-year-olds and younger. And then we have our, our elementary ministry headed up by Matt Archer. That's all that elementary age. And then we have FSM, Fellowship Student Ministries. As a matter of fact, they're having a meeting for mission trips right after the service. And that's your high school ministry. And so Robin heads up our early childhood. Would you say thank you to Robin? She worked with our babies. Yes. <laughs> And even more than clapping for her, she would appreciate if you came and signed up to serve. Is that right, Robin? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. You're going to see today all the babies we have. We need people to serve. I think COVID has been good for the families, right? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We're Robin? multiplying. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm so excited to be here today. With, at the first service, we had four kiddos. So we're, we're growing in the second service. So thanks for being here today to celebrate this whole dedication with us. So I'm going to start by just introducing our first family, the Coffins. You guys want to come on up. They have two kiddos that we're going to dedicate, but let me start. Magnolia Gale. Um, parents are Cash and Savannah, so they have lots of girls. Lily, Violet, and Olive. So they say that uh, Magnolia is the perfect addition to their family. She doesn't fuss about the overwhelming amount of love that she receives from her sisters. <laughs> so they can't wait to watch her grow. Look, she's so quiet and snuggly. So, and Olive, Patricia Coffin. Olive, <laughs> they say Olive is hilarious. She keeps our family laughing. She's adventurous and isn't afraid to try new things. Good food is her passion. So she is a joy. <laughs> and then I want to invite up the Fieldings. This is Mia, Kate. Look at that sweet little bow. Her parents are Nick and Grace Fielding. And they wrote out the sweetest. They said that Mia, Kate is our precious rainbow IVF baby. So after suffering a miscarriage... And then spending the next two years doing infertility treatments, God answered their prayers. So that's a lot to rejoice in. So Emmett Douglas McElroy. <laughs> he has Evelyn and Eloise as big sisters. So Drew and Brittany are mom and dad. And they say that Emmett is an absolute joy. He's a wonderful addition to our family. He has the most precious smile and is loved big by his older sisters. I see dress up in the future for this family. We love you, Emmett Douglas, and continue to pray for your spiritual attributes of humility, adaptability, and a courageous spirit. So we hope that you will come to know the love your Savior has for you. We're going to pray that with you. So. And we have Wyatt Brooks Richardson. This outfit is so cute. Let me just say, I can't get over it. So Rance and Halsey are Wyatt's parents. And they say that Wyatt is pure joy. He knows no stranger. He loves to be outside and has an adventurous spirit. And Wyatt is our greatest blessing and makes our days so much brighter. <laughs> so if you just welcome our families, we're going to get to pray for them. And... Commit. <laughs> well, Fellowship, I'm going to give our parents a charge, and they're going to hopefully say we will in response to that, and then I'm going to give you a charge in just a moment, and, and as I'm giving you a charge, the, the parents are going to go down with their children and meet, meet their families, friends, and community group members, and we'll have a time of prayer, but parents, here's the charge for you, and if you agree, say we will. Will you commit to raising your children in a home that's 
led by the Lord and training your children in the way they should go and, and modeling for them a marriage focused on Christ and serving one another. If so, say, we will. Very good. Well, as you all go down and meet your family down at the bottom of the stage, go ahead and walk down there if you would. And family and friends, if you guys would come up and meet them and just surround them, and we're going to have a time of prayer in just a moment. But as they're walking down, you can snap a picture of the, of the names on the screen, Fellowship, and that's who you can pray for. And as they're doing that, I want to give our church a charge. Fellowship, will you commit to loving these families in at least two ways? And that the first one will be praying for them committing to pray for them, snap a picture of that, pray for them over the coming weeks and months and years to come, and would you commit to serving these families? That might even include serving in early childhood. Are you okay with that? If so, say, we will. Very good. Well, let's gather around as the family and friends gather around and just put a, a hand on a family member or on the child or something, and let's pray for these families. Lord, I pray first for Magnolia. May she realize in the words of Psalm 139 that she is fearfully and wonderfully made. Lord, may she wonder at your works and know full well, full well that she is your creation. May she, along with all her other sisters, Lord, grow to love you, choose you, and follow you. Lord, we pray the same for Olive. Lord, may she realize that you are with her all the days of your life, that you are the mighty warrior who saves, and may she choose you at an early age. Lord, may you take great delight in her and rejoice over her. Lord, may her, her personality and her, her humor never go away, and Lord, may she enjoy being with you. Lord, we also pray for Mia Kate. Lord, that you would be with her. That, Lord, she that she would know that she is a gift from you to her family. Lord, may she be celebrated and Lord, may she choose, too choose you from an early age and may she follow you all the days of her life. And Lord, I pray for Emmett. May he love you. In the words of Joshua 1, 9, may he be strong and courageous. May he not be afraid and be discouraged, but Lord, may he recognize that you are the Lord over all. Lord, may he recognize that you are Lord over all and may he choose you at a young age. And Lord, we pray for Wyatt. That same verse, Lord, that you, he would be strong and courageous, that he would trust in you and he would not be afraid. And we recognize that you are his Lord, Lord, and that you will be with him wherever you you go. And Lord, we pray that for him and for all these kids on this stage and in our church, Lord, that they would hear about you. They would understand what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that, the, that you would be their Savior. And they would walk with you all the days of their lives. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Fellowship, will you give these parents and families a hand one more time? Thank you, families. Go ahead and snap a picture of that list, pray for them, and we'll continue our time of worship. Let's stand and continue to worship together.
take a seat. And there's going to be a scripture on the screen I would love for us just to look at, to pause and take a moment to consider and to meditate on and to just think about the depths and the heights of the love that God has towards us. So take a moment and do that. Thank you for your love that has no limitation or end for us. We praise you for empowering us through the Holy Spirit and rooting us in your love. May we be strengthened and encouraged today as you dwell within us and do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or even imagine. Oh, 
okay you know we can be wowed and wooed by the love and the grace of God amen and we can applaud it and we can say thank you thank you wow thank you amen I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and died and rose again. amazing love, amazing love, how can this be that you, my King, would die? Hey, team, y'all sounded great this morning. Thank you for leading us to focus on God's love. I wonder if you're just going to leave all that out of here. Yeah. Y'all sound great, too, by the way. Uh, first service clapped for themselves when I said that. But y'all are... Uh, but no, I, I mean, it really... I was just sitting back here just listening to the sound in the room, you know, and the team up here, if, if you're not singing, if you're not participating, then it's just a concert, right? It's just a concert. So thank you for being involved. And uh, it's easy to be involved with this group and what they're doing. Hey, I come this morning with a heart of gratitude uh, because I wanted to let you know uh, that when Hurricane Ian hit, we established our partners when we saw that it was going into that area and before they lost power and all that, contacted our um, partner church down there and said, hey, we're going to be ready to help out. And so we opened our disaster relief uh, portal on our website, and immediately you all responded. And this week, we were able to send them $20,000 to help out. And uh, they were thrilled to get it. Yeah. 
Our partner church has a coordinator who is a Fortune 500 CEO, and he knows how to organize things. And he's an old friend of mine and called this week, and he said, hey, we're providing housing for people and just wanted me to express to our body how much that they appreciated our involvement with them. And uh, I told him we'd likely be sending more to help out because those folks have been devastated. And he said, you just can't imagine. People have nowhere to go. But they're getting basic necessities, but he said the greatest need is housing. And so I just want to say thank you. And thank you, too. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard for me to believe that 10 years ago, uh, in 2012, we were really starting to pray about the possibility of Fellowship Fayetteville. And uh, then after that, Fellowship Bentonville. And it's, it's all come to be. We have three different campuses now, and, and all of them are just about the same size. And there's no way we could have fit all those people in this room. And so God went before us knowing what was coming. And uh, it, during that time, just, just recently I was thinking about this, during that time, that 10 years, uh, God working in and through you and your generosity, you've donated over $40 million dollars to these projects in the last 10 years, just to those projects, over $40 million. And we are this close to having it all paid off. And uh, for those of you who've been around for a long time, uh, we had something called the Great Investment where we built all of our student buildings, all of our children's buildings. Uh, we just had to do it. We'd built this room for adults, but we didn't build enough space for children. And they were having their small groups out in Volkswagen buses out in the parking lot, you know. And uh, in stairwells, any place they could find. And uh, so we did that, and it was a long-term project. And we pay that off in December. That will be done in December. And then so we would like to just pay it all off. And I'm calling that eliminate the debt. Let's just get it behind us. And if we all participate and do something, we can do that. We had just a little checklist here. We had a vision. We responded to the vision. We prayed. We built and then we equipped and released leaders. One more thing to check it off, and that's to get that behind us. So thank you uh, for considering and praying about helping us out. You can go to our uh, news page and click that, and it will take you right to a place where you can make those donations. But as our elders were talking the other night, uh, if everyone in our body uh, participated in that in some way, then we would get it knocked out. And so thank you again. I am indeed grateful for all that you've done. Uh, we are in Ephesians chapter 3 this morning, and I want to read our passage to you. It's not going to be on the screen because I just want you to listen to it. Maybe close your eyes uh, as I read it. But this is a passage of scripture talking about the enduring, powerful love of Christ for us. I would encourage you, I, I took a red pencil, I found a red pencil in my desk drawer the other day, and I just drew a big heart over Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. But that's God's love for you. Let me read it. Just listen. Paul says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious riches, Unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep the love of Christ is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is, it is too great to understand fully. And then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Oh Lord, as we study your word, as we've sung these songs this morning, we pray for life's transforming power to move through our hearts. 
the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that as you walk these aisles, that you would speak to us, all different people from all different backgrounds, all different situations. Speak to us where we are and draw us near to yourself. Challenge us, Lord, because we need challenging to grow deeper in you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul had a special relationship with the Ephesians. In Acts, we see a record of his work with the Ephesians. He wanted to go to Ephesus earlier, but the Holy Spirit prevented him from doing so in Acts chapter 16. He, um, he reminds us here that timing is more important than time. Sometimes when you think that something has to be done right away, you just see it, you've reasoned it, you figured it out. Sometimes God says, not yet. Timing is more important than time, especially God's timing. In Acts chapter 18, Paul established and released leaders, Priscilla and Aquila. Then there was Apollos, later on Timothy. They would all be in Ephesus. And uh, he spent almost three years in Ephesus after that. He started a riot there. And uh, they would never forget him. I'll show you the theater in just a moment where he started the riot. In Acts chapter 20, it records his tearful farewell to the Ephesians. He stopped at an island called Miletus as he was on his way to Jerusalem. And it's a very tearful farewell because... They knew that they would probably never see him again. So his relationship and his love for them ran deep. He wanted the very best for them. Now I've got some pictures for you. Uh, Dr. Mark Yarborough, he and I were there one time, and he's standing on something where he shouldn't be standing. Uh, I don't think he was supposed to do that, but he did it anyway. And then we have uh, other pictures of the library there. This is our group standing in front of the library that's dedicated to Celsus. And right after we took this picture, they called the hogs. I don't think that had ever been done before, but this group did it. Right there in Ephesus. And uh, this is uh, on the right-hand side. You see the library down at the end of the, the cardo there. Uh, the old street. Yeah, just imagine that street. The Apostle Paul walking those very streets of Ephesus. Sharing the message of Christ. The message that you're going to hear today. On the left there, you'll see a more modern building. And, and what they've done in excavations, they found some uh, homes where the wealthy lived. And there are beautiful frescoes in there. And right on the other side of that, between there and the library, this is, this is a little aside, um, Cleopatra's sister is buried. Um, she fled to the temple of Artemis there in Ephesus, which there's only a foundation now and one pillar that's left of the temple of Artemis. And she fled there for refuge, but Cleopatra didn't care. They got her out, and she murdered her because she was um, trying to take over the kingdom. And she's buried there in that little spot. And then uh, the next picture is the, the picture of the uh, theater. Um, there's just one person that got in my picture there, you know? Um, but uh, it seated about 25,000 people. It, it was a very large city, probably 3 million people or so lived there. But uh, it's, it's an incredible sight. And the next one is on the boat. I found Sam Hannon meditating one day because he went on the last trip with me. And uh, he's getting a good snooze there. I think we were having a service down below and he was up there snoozing. Uh, and I'm, I'm kidding. He wasn't at that point. But if you're interested in going on the journeys of Paul, uh, Sam's going to be leading a trip there. Uh, and you have that on the screen. There's a QR code that takes you to all the information. And uh, literally you travel across the Aegean Sea between uh, Turkey and Ephesus. And it's really uh, an incredible trip to trace the journeys of Paul. And I think they have about 15 slots left uh, for those that want to go. So I encourage you, if you're interested, sign up. The first three chapters of Ephesians have to de uh, deal with the doctrine for members of Christ's body. Doctrine for members of Christ's body, who we are supposed to be. And we'll wrap that up today because it ends in chapter 3. And in the last three chapters, it talks about the duties of Christian living. What we're supposed to do. 
All right? And so this is an incredible book for the Christian to read and understand because we have instructions for who we're supposed to be and how we are supposed to live. It's an important book. For you to understand. I want, I want you to look at this passage. It's just all of it up there. But look at the relationship in this section between power and love. It seems like a paradox, doesn't it? There is power in the enduring love of Christ. So grasp that. Comprehend it. Let it run through all that you see today. In Ephesians, in, in chapter 1 or chapter 3 of verse 1. Paul says, for this very reason, I kneel before the Father. And then he got sidetracked. It's okay to get a little sidetracked. He got sidetracked and he went back and he reiterated the mystery of Christ. And what was that mystery? That there was now unity between Jew and Gentile. You see, the Jews wanted nothing of that. They wanted nothing of this whole Gentile thing. But God went out of his way to show them that the Gentiles had been brought into that plan. Now, people ask me, how, did the, how were the Jews saved? What did they think would save them? Was it by keeping the law? No. They thought they were going to be saved because they were Jews. They were born Jews. They just, they just kept the law because that was the work that they were supposed to do. They thought there were two types of people in the world, Jew and everybody else. They just happened to call them Gentiles. And through Christ, unity was brought in. Unity between Jew and everybody else. And everyone had the same access to God. And remember in this, there is a, a first century message with a 21st century application for you and me. And here in the church, we need to understand and we need to put into practice that no one person is greater or better than another. The ground is level around the cross. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from. When you walk into this room and when we stand around the cross, we are one. Regardless of your race, your ancestry, your background, or whatever you want to throw in there. We are one in him. Well, he goes through that. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. He talks about the mystery. And in verse 14, he begins. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. And so let me ask you a question. Do our lives demonstrate more evidence of human depravity or of God's transforming love. We need to ask ourselves that question as we read the book of Ephesians. What do you see in us? As believers, what does the world see in us? Do they see God's transforming power that has made us different or do they see someone who's just like everybody else? If it's just like everybody else, then we need to get busy and allowing this passage to do its work in us. That's how important this is. So let me ask you a question based on, on Paul's first statement in verse 14 about kneeling before the Father. Do you pray? Do you pray? Is it just over the spaghetti before you eat in the evening? Or do you have that time where you just commune with God? Where you sit down and you read and you pray and you listen and you respond? You have that quiet place. I have a friend who has a prayer closet. And that's where he goes every morning to spend time in that closet. Paul's not talking about a physical posture here. Paul, uh, James tells us that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And if we believe those words are true, then we need to practice prayer. We pray for protection when we're afraid. We pray for the future. We pray when someone is ill. But we need times every day when we just commune with God. I have to have a list. This is my prayer list. I started out by getting focused. Read, pray, listen, respond. And this is part of my opening prayer, which I take from Acts and from Augustine, from, from uh, Exodus, 
from Psalms. Sovereign Lord, if you're pleased with me, then teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. I know that my faith is more clearly expressed in the way I live than what I claim to believe. And from Augustine, you have made me for yourself, O Lord, and my heart is restless until it rests in you. From the Psalms. So create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Help me to seek the mind of Christ, which leads me to walk by the Spirit. And on and on. And then I begin praying for other people and things. I've got to have a list. Anybody else, your mind wanders when you pray? All it takes is one squirrel for me. And I'm gone. I've got to have a list, something I can stay focused on and work through. And we have the code on the screen. I have a template for you. If you need a template to create a prayer list, it's, it starts out with family and friends. And then uh, I pray for our elders and their families. I pray for our staff. And I pray for people I know who are sick and it changes all the time. I pray for every person in my community group. And then I pray for things in the world. And then on the back, I have my personal goals and then scripture that I'm memorizing. You can do with it whatever you want from this template. I've just left it blank for you, but it's all set up just to have a prayer list. And I promise you, it can change your life. I have a friend. He found out he was hypoglycemic. And the nutritionist told him that he had to stop eating sugar. And he said, I just don't think I can do that. And this is what she told him. She said, if you will stick with the diet that I'm going to give you, if you will eat the things that I tell you to eat, then your body will begin to crave what you eat. Your body will begin to crave what you eat. Now, I've never been able to do Brussels sprouts, you know, but maybe, maybe I could. It's that way with prayer. I promise you, if you get in a pattern of prayer where you're spending time with God every day, there will come a time when if you miss it for some reason, you'll know you missed it. It's like you've missed some nourishment and your mind is just not where it should be. I challenge you, let's follow follow Paul's example of prayer, of spending time with God because you will crave what you eat. Well, Paul says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. The Father is the uncreated one. Everything was established in him and every family, all of us exist because of him. And then he prays for our strength. Okay, that's number one. He prays for our strength. He said, I pray that out of his glorious riches, of which he has plenty, he's not running low. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. The word is dynamis. It's where we get dynamite. The name Dynamite, it's power, living power in the Greek. That he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Through his spirit in your inner being, that deepest part of us. I think we're so busy and so frazzled and so worried that sometimes we've forgotten we have an inner being. That we're just doing our best to make it from thing to thing to thing. We need to remember that that's what needs to be nourished. That's what needs to be filled with the Spirit. Verse 17, so that, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through works. Pay attention. Is that what it says? What does it say? Through faith. It's not through works. 
It's not through the number of things that you do. You can't control God's emotions by the things you do. You can't make him happy or sad. It's through faith in him. Faith is our submission to God's revelation. Faith is our submission to what's in this book. His revelation. Now, seminarian would tell you that this is a very, very Trinitarian verse. We see the Father, we see the Spirit, and we just see the Son. They're all right here. And Paul prays that out of the Father's abundance that we will be strengthened in the innermost part of our being through the work of the Holy Spirit. That Christ will be the center of who we are. He is the center of everything that we are. You know, the business guru, Peter Drucker, once said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Well, I'm going to one-up him here. The Holy Spirit eats strategy for breakfast. It's the Holy Spirit working in and through us that will eat our strategies for breakfast. That needs to be our guide because it's in that inner being that everything changes. You know, when, when you have something difficult, difficult that comes along in life, that you're, it just rocks your world. Maybe the loss of a family member. Maybe you've been told that you have cancer. We can think of a number of things. When that time comes, not if, but when those difficult times come, your inner being needs to be strong and full because that's the wellspring that you're going to draw from. If you've been living your life running on empty spiritually for years and years and years and you get that bad news and say, oh, I got to read the Bible, got to pick it up, you can't even think. You can't think, you can't concentrate, you can't comprehend. It's what's already in here that comes rising to the surface during those difficult times. I see some of you shaking your head because you know exactly what I mean. It rises to the surface. Those scriptures that you've memorized, those prayers that you've prayed, they come from the innermost part of you to the outside. And that's when that peace that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So now is the time to let Christ dwell in your hearts through the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 5 says God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given unto us. That's what happens. He pours the Holy Spirit into that inner being. Why is that so important? Because it's the key to everything. It's the whole reason you exist. It's to glorify God. And the only way you can glorify God is as he is living in you and that's being expressed into the lives of other people. Well, next Paul prays that love will be our foundation. Look at this. He says, and I pray that you being rooted like a plant with roots going down, being rooted and established like a building. There's a very architectural theme here. Being established on a strong foundation in what? Love. Love. And the word he uses there is agape. You know, there are different words in the Greek for different kinds of love. Eros, phileo, you know them. But this is agape. And you know what? We are not, we're not capable of agape love. It's only God loving in and through us. It's only God loving in and through us into the lives of other people. Agape love is a love that expects nothing in return. It just loves. That's the way God loves. And we have the capacity to tap into it because that's the way he wants to love others is through us. 
rooting and rooted and established in love. That you may have power, that strength, together with all the Lord's people, to grasp, to comprehend. Look at this. How wide and how long and how deep, high and deep is the love of Christ. That's what he wants them to reflect to the world. I want you to think about those four words, how wide and long and high and deep. His love is wide enough to reach the whole world. For God so loved the world. It's wide enough to reach the whole world. <laughs> How long is it? It's long enough to reach into forever. How high is it? It's high enough to take us to heaven. And it's deep enough to reach the worst sinner. And who was that? The guy that wrote those words. Paul said, of all the sinners, I'm the worst. And if you think, oh, he's just saying that. Well, remember, he's doing this by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said, of all the bad ones, I'm the worst. It's deep enough to reach you at your lowest point when you think you have no hope. When, when you think you've just made the biggest mistake in the world, his love can reach you way down there and say, come on back. Come on back. I got your hand. Never underestimate the love of God. It is so powerful that it has no limits. Isn't that incredible? that you may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, it's bigger than we can understand, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In other words, you're just overflowing. You're just overflowing with God. And other people are looking at your life saying, what's up with you? You're just overflowing with God. Those first three chapters deal with the doctrines of the faith. That immeasurable agape love. Donald Barnhouse one wrote, once wrote about this love. And he compared it to the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And I love what he wrote. He said, love is the key. Joy is love singing. Peace is love resting. Patience is love enduring. Kindness is love's touch. Goodness is love's character. Faithfulness is love's habit. Gentleness is love's selflessness. And self-control is love holding the reins. It's good, isn't it? Well, I can just imagine the Apostle Paul writing these words and coming to the end of this first section in chapter 3. Writing those words with his broken hands. And becoming so overwhelmed with the great love of God that he now says this. Maybe it was the end of his day. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever.
was a guy who'd experienced that love and even though he was in a prison cell, it didn't bother him. He figured that's where God wanted him at the time. And I just picture him at that moment, just pure speculation on my part, lying down on his cot and going to sleep. Knowing that tomorrow he was going to get up and finish the letter and tell us what we're supposed to do as believers. We've got a lot to look forward to as we continue to study Ephesians. But for this moment, would you just bow for a second? And I want you to just think about your life. About where you are. And allow the Lord to speak into that for a moment. Just invite him to reveal to you the next steps you should take. In prayer and expressing love. Whatever it might be. Let the Holy Spirit prompt you.
capable to minister we give what's freely been given to us amen the very love of God so if you need prayer this morning if you'd like to pray